we want to talk about cyborgs. So by cyborgs, I mean the animals that are blends of organic and electronic components. Mm, and there are a couple of stories that are really bringing home now how far we're sort of progressing with that that aim, that cyborg technology. Things like neural implants and brain prosthetics. Yeah, and also this week, just coincidentally, there was a big meeting at the Royal Society here in London called Cyborg Futures. Mm. And um, I've spoken to a couple of people of them. We're going to hear from them in a minute too. Great. Uh, the first example we're talking through, though, is from tadpoles, cyborg tadpoles. Cyborg tadpoles. Um, this is from Harvard. Researchers have developed a device that they implanted into the, like the proto brain of a very early stage tadpole. Mm. And that, but then the device merged into the brain and grew with it as the tadpole grows. So that you ended up with this like really intimate hybrid of um, electronic device and tadpole brain. Um, So it was a proper cyborg. Alexandra Thompson's here to tell us about it. Alex, first, just reassure us there's no no military dodginess going on with these cyborg No, there's no military dodginess going (laughs) on. So the, the reason for this sort of research is we actually don't fully understand how the brain forms. It's so complex, everything it's capable of, but it has really quite humble beginnings. So what the research team have done from Harvard is they've used ultra soft electronics to implant a device at the earliest stage of development and then it became sort of integrated into the tadpole's brain wow. and could report back to the outside world yeah. on, on the goings on. There's amazing potential there but also the sort of material science of it is fascinating. It's kind of a soft bioelectronic device that grows with the tissue. Exactly. It becomes integrated, it grows with it, and apparently seemingly does no harm. So in the past, we've had to rely on hard electrode wires, which get stuck into the brain. But that can only give a sort of snapshot of the development at that one moment. So now they've used a material where the softness sort of matches that of the brain. And they used it to build a soft, stretchable mesh microelectrode array, Mm. which they placed onto a tadpole's neural plate which is this quite accessible structure. (laughs) Uh, It's sort of flat, but it folds up to become the neural tube. And that is the precursor for the brain. So as the plate folded and expanded, the material became sort of part of it and it grew into the brain. But it still maintained that functionality of reading neural activity while stretching and bending with the tissue. So we could we could see how neural activity progresses as wow. it goes from... So, so the trick was really to get in early there, wasn't it? Um, and when you say reporting back, how do they report back from this thing? So they did it as and when. It wasn't continuous. So a little bit of the mesh sort of was sticking out of the skull because tadpoles do have a cartilage <laughs> skull. And they could then wire that bit up wow. to a computer. I'm trying to remember my development of biology. We start out with neural plates and neural tubes too, right? So this is this is not just some weird quirk of tadpoles. This no. is kind of analogous to what we go through. Yeah, indeed, yeah. And and so once they do this, which sounds like quite an intervention, did the tadpoles develop normally? They developed normally. So there was a group of tadpoles who didn't have this done. They were kind of the, the benchmark to compare them against. And they all hit the same developmental milestones. And some of them were allowed to develop into frogs. Never quite got a clear answer on how many made it to frogs. They mm. might have culled some as, as tadpoles. Mm. But the ones they allowed to progress were, were frogs. And, and they didn't have any sort of immune issues or developmental issues. They just had a, a extra little bit in their brain. Wow, I've got frogs in my pond at the moment. Well, froglets, mm. tiny little ones. But, um, I'm going to look at them now and go, you're still pure, <laughs> non-cyborg, non-cyborg <laughs> type. So are they doing this? Uh, what are they doing this for? I mean, like, they've got this proof of principle, but what else have they learned from this study? Yeah, I think the feet, ex- the feet itself is sort of amazing enough as it is, but they have already learned things. So they've sort of confirmed that the brain's pattern of electrical activity changes sort of quite predictably as tissue differentiates into specialised structures, which then have specialised functions. Um, so we've had loads of cyborgs over the years that we've often reported on, mm. you know, and they're mostly in insects, aren't they? I suppose they're very easy to do to, to meddle around with. A cockroach comes yeah, to mind, yeah. yeah. But are they going to do it on mammals? And like Penny said, we have this neural plate as well. Could you do use this implant on, on mammals? Yes, yeah, so they're sort of beginning to start those experiments. So they've already grown them in rats, but it hasn't been sort of turned on as such wow. yet. So the experiment's underway. Um, there's no results, obviously, but it, it is different because amphibians 
develop in a very different way to, to mammals, like rats have grow in a uterus. Right. So it requires IVF and it's a bit more complex to sort of wire it up as and when, have the little bit sticking out of the skull. Yeah. But um, we could learn a lot more about conditions like autism and schizophrenia. So if you have animal models for those conditions, it's not a perfect match, but you can see sort of how the how the brain develops whilst having those conditions sort of coexisting. Yeah. So I said at the start there was this meeting at the Royal Society. Um, it was about making humans more cyborg-like. Um, and Jonathan Roster is a professor of robotics at the University of Bristol. He was one of the organisers of the meeting. I asked him why we want to be more cyborg-like. And here he is. I think that cyborgs have got great opportunity for uh, helping us to overcome some of the challenges with ageing and with disability, for example. As we get older, we find it more difficult to move around. We have age-related frailty, and it's very difficult sometimes to move, for example, from the chair in the living room to the kitchen to make a cup of tea, or to go out for a walk with one's friends. At that point, wouldn't it be great if we could implant artificial muscles to overcome some of the weaknesses of our own muscles. And so that's kind of one type of uh, cyborg future. So as you can imagine, there's many challenges involved in making human cyborgs. Um, so there's technical ones, you have to integrate this artificial system into, uh, into our muscles mechanically, and they have to be biologically compatible so you don't set off some immune reaction. Mm. And they often, they have to sort of embed neurologically as well into our nervous systems and our brains. And Jonathan calls this biosymbiosis, um, and they also need to power the devices inside us. Um, and any energy you know, has to be getting, getting to the device, but also waste products taken out. And then beyond the sort of technical, there's also ethical, social challenges too. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and I asked him about that as well. Here he is on that. One of the big challenges that uh, we're addressing is how acceptable is it to make implantable artificial muscles, devices that give you a boost to restore your abilities or potentially to give you a boost beyond what your original abilities were. And of course, the only way that people will embrace this future is to trust the technologies that are being developed. So trust is a core concept behind any kind of cyborg futures. And finally, one of the challenges that we're addressing is uh, regulation and associated with that is the ethics of this. The fact that we could make a cyborg future doesn't necessarily mean that we should make a cyborg future. So I think overall, I really feel that a cyborg future that we envisage of supporting and restoring mobility and ability as we get older and we need to have supported independence is really, really important and can lead to a healthier life and a higher quality of life. Cyborg boost beyond your current capabilities. I'm sure you're not surprised that I, I don't want any part of that. <laughs> but I've never heard that argument before about it supporting us in older age and sort of restoring. I, that's a really compelling argument. Yeah, yeah, it does. It, it's a slippery slope though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, I, mean I, I feel almost obliged to mention Terminator and, you know, sci-fi. We nearly did a whole segment know, on cyber, but, you know, <laughs> cyborgs. <laughs> but, but yeah, but this does make you feel more positive about the whole mm. thing, doesn't it? Um, and it does feel like we're on the edge of a really big shift in what's happening with all the things that are going on um, that we're reporting about, but that happened at this meeting as well. Um, and I spoke to someone else from that meeting as well, Tamar Makin. She's Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at Cambridge University. And here's what she had to say. I really believe we're at the edge of a major technological shift where machines aren't just around us, they're actually becoming a part of us. And uh, implants are already in place to help us with locked-in patients, for example, for them to share their thoughts or giving amputees a sense of touch from an artificial limb, like feeling the ground as they go. And we know that big tech companies are already working now on ways to let us control virtual environments just by thinking without needing to use our hands. And as this tech improves, uh, we can also think about how they would make our daily lives easier, for example, by uh, seamless interaction with devices or by allowing us to boost our productivity at work, like teaming up with a robot to lift heavy things. So as these uh, implants move from medical tools to everyday tech, we need to rethink what good design actually means for us. 
Developers focus on tissue safety, but users might care more about protecting their personal data and privacy. Engineers think about nerve compatibility, but users might be more interested in comfort or the style of the technologies. And when it comes to invasiveness, users aren't necessarily thinking about how deep the technology invades their skin. They might actually uh, worry more about how much using or disusing the technology is going to get in the way of their everyday life. So from my perspective, if we want this technology to really work, it has to be built around what people actually care about. And to do that, we need the public involved in shaping how the technology is being developed. Because if we don't, we might miss a really big and exciting chance to get this right, which for me would be a real shame. Thank you.